50 years ago, young women kept disappearing in broad daylight in the college towns of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. College students, high school students, even a middle school girl vanished. Only to turn up a few days later, their bodies mutilated, found on the back roads of Washtenaw County. Tonight, Rob Wojcik is here with the story of the Michigan murders. Hila Monica, if you were alive in 1969, you remember the serial murders. If not, you're about to hear a story that will scare you. Over the next three nights, I'm going in depth to tell you about murder, fear, and terror that happened right here at home. For the third time in the past two years, the body of an Ann Arbor Ypsilanti co-ed has been found. The girl brutally murdered. This is a true story. The 18-year-old Eastern Michigan University freshman disappeared from Ypsilanti's Main Street around 1 p.m. on Wednesday. I have decided to invoke a long-standing schedule. They said that now is the time to emphasize coordination between all law enforcement... A story that took place exactly 50 years ago today. So it's definitely a very sick individual and a very dangerous individual. It was a time before Charles Manson, before Ted Bundy, before the term serial killer was even a term. It was a cause of death as a result of a severe blow to the head. Yet it happened here, just outside of Detroit, where tens of thousands of students walk the same campuses today and travel the same back roads where a killer dumped victim after victim after victim. University officials, both here and at the University of Michigan, say that they really can't provide maximum uh, protection for the girls. Now, using archived news film, some of which hasn't been seen since it aired here on Channel 2 a half century ago. And we are doing everything humanly possible to try to apprehend this killer or killers. I'm going to tell a tale of a time of terror. We live off campus and we're in a house with 10 girls alone and it's sort of scary at night and revisit the places. You would not know that this area even existed if you didn't really know the area. He knew this area like the back of his hand. And the people who lived it. Most of the girls were sliced. Their breasts were sliced, throat was sliced. And you'll meet people who've never talked about their encounters with a savage killer on television before. He was just kind of following me home, you know? I said, no, no, really, I'm okay. And he said, you mother ugly aren't you gonna get in the car with me? It's July 1969. A time of peace and love. And you were a hippie. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was a rock and roll musician, baby. <laughs> Some students are into fraternities. Some flower power. There were the freaks, and then there were the frats. In the TV biz, it wasn't unusual for a reporter to interview someone who was smoking a cigarette. Heck, it wasn't even unusual for a reporter to be puffing a pipe as well. Police officers, some on foot. But the reporters here at WJBK, as well as the freaks and the frats and the fuzz, were in the midst of a manhunt for a monster. Miss Biedemann was last seen Wednesday afternoon by her roommate here at Downing Hall. Officials, university officials, have refused newsmen entrance to the building and not allowed them to talk to the girl's roommate or any of her friends. When she was last seen, she was... Karen Sue Bynaman, an 18-year-old freshman at Eastern Michigan University, was missing, and everyone feared she'd be the latest victim in a brutal murder spree. The killing began exactly two years earlier, in July of 1967. That's when 19-year-old student Mary Fleasure, a devout Catholic girl, took an evening walk from her apartment near the EMU campus. The building hasn't changed much. Mary was seen by a neighbor being catcalled by a young man who screeched his car to a stop and appeared to be trying to get her to take a ride. He put his car in front of her while she's walking down the street. Author Greg Fournier was an EMU student at the time. He's the writer of the book, Terror in Ypsilanti. Fournier says the witness watched this cat and mouse game between the driver of the shiny car and Mary until eventually she was out of the neighbor's view. 
Mary Fleasure was never seen alive again. Her body was found dumped here a month later near LaForge and Gettys Roads. She'd been repeatedly stabbed in the chest. State police say the killer had come back to the scene at least three times. He'd moved poor Mary's body and had apparently mutilated her further with each visit. Many were veterans on the force and had never seen anything quite that horrific. Then, on a hot Sunday night a year later, a 20-year-old student left this house on Emmett Street in Ipsy and walked a block to a bus stop on Washtenaw Avenue. This is where Joan Shell was last seen. She was hitchhiking to Ann Arbor after missing a bus. Her friend saw her get into a car with three young men. Joan Shell was never seen again. Her body was found a few days later here off Earhart Road in Ann Arbor. Back then, they were just building this nice neighborhood. I'd imagine the people living here have no idea this was a dumping ground for at least two murder victims. Joan Shell had 25 stab wounds when she was found in what's now somebody's backyard. Oh, my parents keep calling me every night to make sure it's not me. In March of 1969, 16-year-old Marilyn Skelton was a rock and roll party girl. Her brother dropped her off at the Arborland Mall. She wanted to get to her boyfriend's crash pad in Ipsy. He was a drummer in this man's band. His name is Ed. She had called me from uh, Arborland Shopping Center out on Washtenaw mm -hmm. and uh, looking for a ride over to our place. I didn't have a car. I said, sorry, Marilyn. I can't come and get you. So you may have been the last person that ever spoke with him. Very possible. Like Mary Fleasure and Joan Shell, Marilyn Skelton had been killed somewhere else and her body dumped outside Ypsilanti. She was the most brutally murdered and he did uh, really unspeakable things uh, to her. We Washtenaw County Sheriff at the time, the Doug Harvey, explains. He would always shove something up their vagina. Marilyn Skelton was found with a large tree branch violating her 16-year-old body. The worst was yet to come. When we come back after the break, the killer takes his youngest victim, a 13-year-old girl. It's 1969. There have been three murders so far, and now they're about to find the killer's youngest victim. The youngest victim was only in eighth grade. 13-year-old Dawn Basin was last seen walking along these railroad tracks, taking a shortcut home. She never made it. See, this is Railroad Street. Yeah. Retro Kimmer is a blogger. She explains the shortcuts still used today. It's a lot closer than if you go down here to La Forge. Right. And you know, she'd have to go all the way around, all the way back to her house. This is the shortcut. And there's her house. Dawn was a normal 13-year-old child, lived in this white frame home. Dawn Basin was only a few hundred yards from her home when she vanished in April of 69. 50 years later, her neighbor and horse riding buddy Kay still remembers her. We were really good friends. Yeah, I mean, I know it's hard. Yeah, to... she'd be a grandma. Cheryl, today. another friend, describes the little girl who went missing. She was tough. She was generous and sweet. The morning after the sweet girl was missing, Sheriff Harvey was here on Vreeland and Gale Roads where her body was found dumped. He remembers the terrible sight when he looked under that sheet. Here was a young little girl. It, it tore us apart, seriously, it, it had a, had effect on us, on every officer who's seen this. I went to the funeral home and Don's mother asked me to sit next to her. Don Basom's funeral was a heart-wrenching affair captured by WJBK film cameras. Here to Forest Hill Cemetery near the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, an almost frantic search for the girl's killer goes on. At first it was college girls being victimized, but when he took a little kid. Like the first three victims, Dawn had been murdered somewhere other than where her body was found. 
Washtenaw deputies searched the handful of miles between her abduction site and where the body was found and found her orange sweater and the signs of a deadly struggle between Dawn and her killer. Articles of her clothing were found here, wiring similar to that. He took her to that abandoned house out on LaForge Road. She was in the basement of that house. And they found glass in her elbows and knees. She had gotten out of there and got across the yard to the back toward the barn, and that's where she was attacked and murdered. As you continue further north... The house and the barn were abandoned buildings. The killer must have known no one would be there. It was clear he knew the area. And after the crime was cleared, the killer once again returned to the scene of the crime. Items, including Dawn's missing earring, were found in the abandoned barn weeks after her murder. University of Michigan student Alice Kalem was next. She was uh, going to uh, a birthday party at some place called uh, the Depot House. Someone reported seeing her on the back of a motorcycle leaving the club. After all, it was now June, perfect weather for a 22-year-old student to take a ride on the back of a bike. If so, it was her last ride. Her neck was slit from ear to ear. I remember that. She found her out on Territorial Road. A lonely abandoned barn was nearby. Then, just weeks later, a girl 2,000 miles away was brutally killed. No one could have possibly connected the two at the time, but Roxy Phillips, a 17-year-old high school senior, was last seen when a shiny cutlass pulled to the curb, cutting her off. This was in Salinas, California, but the car stood out because it had Michigan license plates. There were two people that uh, saw her in that car. The car also stood out because the driver pulled away, screeching his tires, and almost hit a female driver. The woman in that car had seen enough of the dress that, that Roxy had on, said, oh, it's a red dress, and it's, it has a floral print on it and whatnot, which is what she was wearing. Roxy Phillips was found beaten and strangled with the floral pattern belt to the outfit she was wearing. She was dumped in a patch of poison oak in Pescadero Canyon outside of Salinas. Just 10 days after Roxy Phillips' body was found in California, a freshman at Eastern didn't return to her dorm one night. The search continues. There are no solid leads at this moment. But tips by the On Wednesday afternoon, July 23rd, 1969, Karen Sue Bindeman came into this wig shop on Washtenaw Avenue in downtown Ipsy. She said, I've just done two things that I haven't done in my life. I'm buying a wig and I t accepted a ride on a motorcycle with a stranger. This comment didn't sit well with Joan Goshi, the owner of the shop. She and her assistant stepped outside onto this very street and saw a clean-cut young man on a shiny motorcycle. He turned his head away. At the chocolate shop next door, the shopkeeper hadn't met Karen Bideman, but she couldn't help but notice the nice-looking Triumph bike in front of her shop. She watched as a young woman came out of the wig shop next door and hopped on behind the handsome young man who'd been straddling the motorcycle in front of her shop. Karen Bindeman took the last ride of her life. Today, it's reported that she arrived at the wig shop in Ypsilanti, the last place where she was seen alive, with that man and on that motorcycle. In part two of this series, another grisly discovery. The young lady was discovered approximately uh, five o'clock last night. Uh, she was uh, nude. I was the first one on the scene. You'll meet the EMU rookie cop who first came face to face with a killer, someone he knew. And when I started writing the license numbers down, he got a little, oh, perturbed in that, that, you know, go play your game somewhere else. And we'll put a face to the murderer who stalked young women 50 years ago right here on our college campuses. A man who still haunts the memories of so many from his cell in a Michigan state prison. It was a terrifying time, and tomorrow it will be the 50 years, 50 years to the day, when the last victim, Karen Vineman, disappeared. My series will continue tomorrow night on Fox 2 News at 10. Yeah, just chilling to watch that. It seems that the killer targeted each one of his victims. They were out walking alone. These were innocent girls. I mean, this is, uh, these were innocent kids yeah. who were just out going to school, going walking home, business. and he obviously stalked them 
found them when they were alone or when he thought he was going to get them alone and uh, snatched them and did terrifying, mm. horrible things to them. Crimes of opportunity. Crimes of opportunity. You make a point of not mentioning his name in your first series of reports. Why is that? Well, I want this story to be about the ladies and the terror and, and, and about all the people here that lived through this, the, the, the heroes, the cops, people that broke the case. I will be mentioning his name tomorrow and I will have some things on him, but for tonight, I want this to be about the, the poor young women that disappeared. Yeah, we'll I mean, 50 years ago, tomorrow, the mm -hmm. last victim disappeared. I mean, imagine how terrifying that was. And they are the most important part of the story, no question it's, about it. It's super sad. Yes. It's super sad talking to people after all these years who still have vivid memories and have lived their whole lives thinking, I lost my friend 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's In awful. Blink of an eye. Yep. Right. We'll see you tomorrow, Rob. Part thank two you. tomorrow. All right, thank you.